Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and murderous phone numbers. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at 976 Evil. This 1988 horror follows a pair of cousins who come into contact with a premium rate phone number offering a horror scope to callers. The weaker of the two begins using newly gifted powers from the number to seek revenge on his bullies, but soon finds these dark forces are more in control than he is. 976 Evil is the directorial debut of Robert England, who we all know and love from films like Eaten Alive, 2001 Maniacs, Behind the Mask, and of course, A Nightmare on Elm Street. This is actually only one of two movies England has ever directed, the second being Killer Pad. But they say you're all only 16. Is that a problem? These things better not be bogus. It looked really bad. England had reached pretty big stardom by this point, and he was hoping to try his hand at directing, and he was approached with an offer by producers Lisa Hansen and Paul Hertzberg. They originally wanted him to star and direct the film, but England opted to stay behind the camera this time, although he does some voice work in the movie. The screenplay was co-written by Trick or Treat's Rhett Topham and Robin Hood's Brian Helgeland. Helgeland actually wrote the screenplay for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 the same year. I also probably need to explain this premise a little bit as I wasn't even sure what a 976 number was until I researched the movie. Basically 976 numbers were a sector of premium rate numbers you could call to hear a pre-recorded message and they would charge by call or by minute. They functioned similarly to sex hotlines except you know you weren't talking to anybody just listening to a message. Shows like SNL used them to conduct live polls and kids could call up characters like Santa Claus and even Freddy Krueger. They were a pretty short fad, but they were popular enough at the time for a movie about them to be pretty exciting. The film stars Stephen Joffreys from Fright Night and Fraternity Vacation as Hoax, Patrick O'Brien from No Holds Barred and Blood and Concrete as Spike, Sandy Dennis from The Out of Towners and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf as Lucy, Leslie Dean from Girlfriend from Hell and Freddy's Dead as Susie, and Jim Metzler from Circuitry Man and Hot to Trot as Marty. 976 Evil had a super low budget of around 850000 but England was able to call in a few favors. He managed to pull in the amazing Kevin Yeager, who did England's makeup for Nightmare 2 and 3, as well as his whole team to make the special effects. Jaeger is one of the most prolific effects artists ever, with achievements like designing and creating Chucky, so the effects in the movie stand out compared to a lot of the other aspects. Cinematography was done by Paul Elliott, who also shot Friday Part 7, My Girl, and Fat Albert. This is also where England met his future wife, Nancy Booth, who is a set director that has worked on Chud 2 and Masters of the Universe. They're still married today and are very cute together. The movie was released to theaters and made around 3 million at the box office, actually tripling its budget. It was met with pretty poor reviews due to its dated premise, messy story, and cliche characters, although some people find it to be pretty underrated. It currently has a 15 and 28% on Rotten Tomatoes, so while a lot of people believe the film had potential, it seems it never quite lived up to it. Thank you to my patron Olivia for requesting 976 Evil for me to review. I've watched other reviews of it on YouTube, but I've never actually sat down and watched it myself. I hope y'all are ready for a fish fry, cause we're watching 976 Evil. The movie opens on this guy roaming the streets as a demonic voice calls to him from various telephones. He's eventually compelled to answer this alleyway payphone, but when he grabs a hold he is electrocuted, set ablaze, and launched to his death. We hop over to a horror movie marathon at Diablo's theater where the employees are playing poker. Angsty boy Spike foolishly loses the pink slip to his Harley, but Marcus allows him to pay the cash value if he can come up with it. We head over to the very feline, very evangelical Wilmoth house where we meet Spike's nerdy cousin Hoax and his overbearing mother Lucy. Spike returns home to his strange, detached apartment next to the Wilmoths, where Hoax has set up a pneumatic tube system so they can communicate. He opens a magazine to find an advertisement for the 976 Evil Horror Scope, and Spike immediately picks up the phone. That was fucking easy. 
He presses 666 to receive his horror scope, where the supposed master of the dark urges Spike to take risks in order to get out of his financial jam. He sneaks into the Wilmoth house for a swig of milk and to steal Aunt Lucy's kitchen cabinet money stash inside of a fish trophy. Lucy catches him and the commotion wakes up Hoax, although she sends him to bed after threatening to spank him. Lucy is angered when Spike questions her parenting and says her sister failed to instill any discipline in him before she died. The fish trophy money was actually left to Spike by his mother, but Lucy is in charge of it until he turns 21. Y'all don't have bank accounts you could put that money in? Spike doesn't care though and heads out with the money, but Lucy makes one last attempt to show him the way of God. And it starts raining fucking fish, I guess which Lucy takes as a sign from the Lord. He's our God! Fishes! Spike is understandably confused and calls up the horoscope, which is aware he is no longer in debt. Hoax sends over a fish and asks Spike how he did it, thinking he was responsible for the fish storm. The next day at school, Hoax is receiving a barrage of swirlies from Marcus and his buddies when Spike enters, who hands over the money to save his precious Harley. He tells Airhead, Rags, and Jeff to release his cousin and quickly beats them up when they refuse. Hoax wants to beat them up further, but Spike refuses and advises that he stop telling people they've been blessed by the Lord. Meanwhile, Marty Palmer from Modern Miracle Magazine arrives to interview Lucy and she tells him all about the heavenly fish. Hoax shows off his sick new ride to Spike and his sort of girlfriend Susie and excitedly shares with her that the two will travel cross country on their bikes this summer, if his mama lets him. He poorly flirts with Susie as Spike races home and Hoax immediately crashes into a fence. That night, this random lady burns the 976 evil card, but she is interrupted by a payphone. The demonic voice reminds the woman that they have a deal, and a whole store full of wacky phones start exploding. Oh damn, she got the Suspiria treatment. Marty is at a diner when he notices Spike arrive at an auto parts store, and as he waits outside, he decides to call up the horoscope. The voice urges him to steal some gloves he was eyeing inside the shop, but he can't bring himself to steal from his friend Virgil. The voice calls back and tells Spike to steal again, before switching off to a seemingly pre-recorded message telling him to look both ways before crossing the street. Spike does not look both ways and even manages to drop a bunch of shit in the middle of the road, making it very easy for this devil car to turn on and try to run him over. Mark pushes Spike out of the way just in time, and now I guess they're having dinner together? Mark wants to talk about the fish, but Spike heads out to pick up Susie, I guess. Hoax has a sweaty good time watching the two have sex, and he feels the need to let them know he enjoyed the show. They decide to smoke and stroke somewhere else, giving Hoax the perfect opportunity to admire Susie's underwear. Spike decides to hit up the movie theater poker lounge before their flick, and Hoax comes across the horoscope ad. The voice suggests Hoax ask out the girl he likes, and based on those panties he's clutching, I think we know who he has in mind. Spike gets caught up in poker and blows off Susie, but he's able to convince her to go home and maybe go on another date with him. And that's when the poor girl runs into Hoax outside the theater. Susie invites him to grab a pizza with her, and broke-ass Hoax has to borrow a quarter for the jukebox. We get a rock and roll montage of Spike cleaning house at the game, and Susie and Hoax having a fun night together, that is before she is terrified by a daddy long legs. Hoax loves spiders and carries it outside when she asks him to kill it, only for Marcus and his goons to arrive and squish the little guy. They begin publicly humiliating Hoax at this apparently empty pizza joint, even finding Susie's underwear in his back pocket. That obviously upsets Susie enough to leave him behind, and Marcus and the boys put Hoax in a dumpster. They eventually leave and Hoax crawls out to the payphone filthy and furious, and the voice tells him to block out the haters and win the heart of his lady. He heads home to receive instructions on how to scare Susie, which involves a pentagram, some candles, and his pet spider. Hoax has gone full Frank Cotton as the voice whispers to him that Susie is his now, and she opens her reheated dinner to find a cluster of spiders. The venomous critters swarm Susie as she screams, and Hoax realizes this is more than a prank. He smashes his spider to stop the ritual, but it's too late as Susie drops dead. 
Hoax rushes over to Susie's and confirms the kill, and he is questioned by Lucy when he returns. She is angry about the excessive phone bill he has racked up and believes he has been calling into sex hotlines. He tries to blame it on Spike, but while Lucy believes Spike led him to this, he does have a phone of his own. She rips the phone out of the wall, and Hoax doesn't seem too happy about that. Marty, who is actually a private investigator, shows up at the school to speak with Spike, but Hoax happens to overhear and warns him. Hoax is insulted when Spike doesn't want help taking care of this guy, and lets it slip that he did something to Susie. Spike drags him into the locker room and demands to know what happened, and Hoax confesses to killing her. He says the guy from 976 Evil told him how to do it, and that she was out screwing Marcus and deserved it? Spike throws him down and spits on him, but Hoax says soon their roles will be reversed. The boys head their separate ways, and P.I. Marty finds the torn ad on the floor. He locates the business address for the number, which is filled with a variety of raunchy and bizarre hotlines. He meets with the manager Mark Dark, who explains that 976 Evil was his first pre-recorded number. He was hoping a pre-recorded template would be cheaper and therefore make more money, but it performed poorly and he shut it down three months ago. Dark laments that people aren't as interested in the underworld as they used to be, and it's much harder to make a quick buck these days. Hoax starts feeling a bit froggy in biology class, and in the bathroom he notices his body is going through some changes. Rags and Jeff walk in, hoping to snort some crank, but they quickly find more interest in harassing Hoax. He warns them to stop, and he ultimately slashes Jeff's face with his new goblin hand. Yo, my boy Jeff didn't drop his ciggy though. He smashes Rags' skateboard, and he tells Jeff to pass on the message that Hoax is not to be messed with anymore. After peeping in Hoax's room, Spike gets a call from The Voice, which is seemingly coming from Hoax, who for once in his life wants some privacy. Now Marty is getting drinks with the school counselor, and he believes the raining fish was a warning from God, but he isn't sure what about. Hoax takes back his telephone and shows off his creepy deep voice while threatening his mother, and Marty returns to the 976 warehouse. He breaks into the horoscope closet and listens in as Hoax communicates with the voice, although he can only hear Hoax. He agrees to some terms and conditions to receive more power, and he unveils some pretty new cat eyes. A phone rings as Marty flees the building, and the voice tells him he's too late before shocking him. Angela the school counselor arrives and picks up Marty, and he tells her to take him to the Wilmoths. The boys are playing poker as usual when Hoax arrives, and Marcus has Rags and Jeff take him outside to learn a lesson. Meanwhile, Spike has showed up too late for Susie's memorial service, and now this chick is putting on a strip show for Marcus and Airhead, I guess. Their show is interrupted again by Hoax, who is wondering if he can join the poker game with a pair of hearts. Airhead grabs the chick and wisely gets the fuck out of there, but Marcus foolishly takes Hoax on with his butterfly knife. He slaps Marcus across the room, also knocking over some cleaning spray. Hoax tosses a cigarette into the liquid to start a fire, and he uses his big sharp foot to stop Marcus from grabbing his knife. He uses it to cut right through the bully's hand, but seems to leave after that, so maybe Marcus lives. Wait, you morons ran to the roof? Hoax sneaks up behind them and Airhead starts swinging his chain, but he quickly overpowers him and impales him on the neon trident sign. Marcus's dumbass didn't leave either, so Hoax finds him and brutally stabs the kid to death off screen. Hoax leaves as the theater goes up in flames, and as usual, Lucy starts yelling at him. He smacks the shit out of her, I think killing her, and damn, he kills the parrot too. Now the house is glowing, and Angela and Marty arrive at the Wilmoth house. Lady, you are a high school guidance counselor, you need to go home. And Marty, I don't care where you go, but it should not be into a teen boy's room via a trellis. He finally gets to the top, only for Hoax to startle him, and he falls to the ground unconscious. Great job, Marty. Angela decides to let herself in the house, which is cracking at the seams and freezing cold, and Hoax calls to her to come upstairs. She does so for some reason, and enters Lucy's cat-infested bedroom. What's attracting all these cats, you ask? Well, it's fresh Mrs. Wilmoth flesh, of course. She doesn't run away, and Hoax grabs her, and after two jokes, he starts groping her. 
Marty starts to wake up as Hoax launches Angela down the stairs, and the floor starts to fall away as a pit to hell opens up. Oh yeah, Spike is a character in this movie, and he helps up Marty, and they break in as Hoax pursues Angela. Marty grabs her and they head to the other side of the house, and Hoax explains to his cousin that this is the beginning of Armageddon. Spike shoots him in the face to little effect, and they get into a pretty one-sided fist fight. Hoax keeps his promise to spit on him as hell has finally frozen over. Marty and Angela are escaping via an absolutely absurd pipe, and Hoax starts shaking it as the pit opens up beneath them. He's interrupted again by Spike, who tries appealing to Hoax by reminding him of the cross-country trip they were planning. At first, the devil says Hoax is long gone, but Spike is sure his cousin can hear him and continues describing the trip. Hoax's voice breaks through as he thinks of their possible destinations together, and he begs Spike to take him with him as the devil takes over again. Realizing Hoax can't stop the possession, he grabs his cousin and launches him through the window and back into hell. The pit closes, Marty and Angela survive, and we hop over to the 976 warehouse to find Mark Dark. He's listening in as another clueless caller falls victim to 976 Evil, and he adds a picture of Hoax to his folder. And that's 976 Evil. It's a pretty fun horror movie. I'm not gonna pretend it's perfect or anything, but I enjoyed my time with it. I have an appreciation for niche horror movies that utilize the technology of their time. Upon release, a lot of them probably seemed innovative, but a lot of films have been trapped in time due to the rapid technological advances we've seen in the last 30 or so years. A few that come to mind are Halloween Resurrection, Brain Scan, and Strangeland. 976 Evil definitely falls into that weird realm of movies, as it's a premise that couldn't really be made to happen today without drastic changes to the story. It gives the film some fun novelty, but that only gets you so far. It does have a lot of low-budget horror movie characteristics, which can be good or bad depending on who you are. High schoolers are played by 20 and 30 year olds, the little bit of CGI is not good, and there are occasionally out of focus shots and muffled audio. None of those things really bother me, my biggest issues lie within the script. I genuinely don't understand who Marty is. First he claims to work for a magazine, but then he says he's a private investigator. Who hired him? The magazine? And then why the fuck is the counselor working with him? I know there were some scenes cut from the theatrical cut, which is the version I watched, but their inclusion in the story seems very unnecessary to me. Spike could have just as easily gone to the 976 warehouse to learn about the number. Not to mention, Spike is literally gone for like 20 to 30 minutes while Hoax is killing the bullies and his mother, and it's just weird that the protagonist is just gone for that long. There are aspects of the movie I really like though. The fish motif was a smart, unexpected inclusion, and the locations in the movie do create a memorable world. I think all of the allusions to the devil were a bit too on the nose, but I appreciate the effort. The movie also has great utilization of a process called introvision, which meant combining footage of actors within sets inside of miniatures. It was obviously used for the finale, but also to create sets like the movie theater. Hoax's transformation looks solid, as do all of Jaeger's practical effects. Stephen Joffrey surprised me with the quality of his performance. There were times I felt really bad for him and times I wanted to wring his neck, so he showed off some good range. In the 90s, Joffrey's actually moved to porn, but he returned to horror movies in the mid-2000s. I might throw one of his newer movies on just to see what he's up to now. All in all, 976 Evil is a fun movie that is very of its time, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it utilizes its premise very well. The pacing is all over the place and the characters are pretty cliché, but I would say it has more merit than its ratings would have you think. I am sad the movie's poor reception kept England away from the director's chair, but it was probably for the best he stayed in front of the camera. Thank you again to my patron Olivia for requesting 976 Evil for me to review, and remember you too can request movies for me to review by becoming a patron. You'll also get early access to certain videos and vote in polls for upcoming franchises. Well that's about it, 976 Evil did receive a sequel in 1992, and I'll maybe cover it one day? But for now we are continuing our look through the Hannibal Lecter franchise, so tune in two weeks for my review of Red Dragon. 
Thank you all for joining me and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of 976 Evil. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should join my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.